Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, I would like also to thank the organizers for inviting me over to discuss the climate scientists, given the climate problem or the climate change is having a lot of problems right now with the revolution in Egypt. Priority of climate change has shifted backward because we have a lot of other uh, priorities. But we will see that some of the problems are really pressing, that we have to work out climate change problems in order to work or solve other problems. Uh, as mentioned by uh, uh, Fritz, the problem of climate change has two main issues. The greenhouse gas emissions and the vulnerability or possible adaptation, especially for developing countries. We are concentrating, he has mentioned the problem of footprints and the greenhouse gas emissions and mitigation measures, but we are concentrating on the problem of impacts and vulnerability and resilience and what can we do from our basic experience in Egypt uh, trying to solve this problem, especially for urban land. Uh, first of all, why do we, uh, why we are concerned about urban land? Urban land or urban areas are expanding at a very high rate. Uh, at least over 40% of greenhouse gas emissions are from urban areas. So it's a main contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> Transportation systems and land use changes uh, and human economic activities and needs are uh, high in urban areas. Uh, also, before we continue, I would like to mention that in Egypt, Egypt emits about 0.7% of greenhouse gas emissions of the world, 0.7%. Yet it encounters an impact on the gross national product by 12 to 15 percent. Egypt has an institutional capability for reducing greenhouse gases, but no institutional capability for collecting information on impacts, uh, enforcing impacts, uh, developing methodologies for impacts and upgrading our uh, awareness and, uh, and resilience. The urban services, as we all know, the water resources and the sewage, uh, the, the waste and institutional capabilities, the energy supply, the communication, the green areas, transportation, all of these systems are well known to you. This is the main infrastructure that is highly vulnerable to the potential impacts of climate change. Now, what are the kind of climate changes uh, we, we expect in the future? Uh, the, the phenomena of climate change has been 
well emphasized, it's now accepted, and there are no challenges for it, almost no. Uh, perhaps there are maybe one or two percent of the scientists uh, who do not agree with the ideas, but the phenomena is well established. We are, we are expecting to encounter an increase of the average temperature, sea level rise, and salt water intrusion, and the salt water intrusion, especially in coastal areas, is, cannot be forgotten. Shortage of water supplies and lifetimes of infrastructures, and we also expect to have a very important aspect, which is the increase of frequency, severity, and duration of extreme events. This is proven uh, phenomena that has to be taken into consideration. The frequency, severity, and duration of floods are expected to increase. Heat waves, we have encountered a very strong heat wave uh, last Ramadan, and a result of that was very clear in energy blackout and uh, problems of pricing of vegeta vegetables and pricing in general. Wind and dust storms, we have to uh, to, to carry out planning based on increased wind and dust storms and marine storms. In Alexandria last couple of years, in 2010, in December 2010, Alexandria encountered a very strong uh, marine storm that uh, was capable of destroying a lot of uh, the area of Cornish and Alexandria. Droughts and meteorological disasters are also expected to increase. Uh, in addition, the city of the coastal cities of Egypt are vulnerable to perhaps tsunamis. This is also expected uh, to be at least taken into consideration in any design uh, in the future. As a result, the energy consumption uh, is expected to increase and the socio-economic implications uh, are also expected. This is the vulnerability index for the Nile Delta in Egypt. You can see the vulnerability to one meter or two meters sea level rise, including inundation of some of the cities or some parts of the cities, not total inundation, but salt water intrusion included in that, with the salt water intrusion affecting all aspects, including agricultural productivity, uh, foundations of buildings, uh, uh, the human activities in the region. And we can see that in addition to the coastal area, we have also the part, parts of Cairo uh, and the region because of the high, extremely high density of population in this region. Uh, it is expected to encounter implications of climate change, heat stresses, and uh, problems of health effects, and so on. This is a vulnerability assessment carried out for Morocco. Uh, this is carried out using <coughs> We have actually carried out this investigation in Alexandria and all of the coastal cities 
of Egypt, uh, except Except the Damir, we have carried out vulnerability assessment using remote sensing and geographic information systems uh, in order to identify the uh, urban areas or land use areas that are expected to be inundated by a sea level rise of one meter or two meters and so on. And this is also the work carried out recently in uh, Morocco by uh, Sunusi and the others uh, concerning the city of Morocco. This is what we expect the dust storms increasing in frequency and severity. This is Alexandria, December, uh, 2010, I'm sorry, it's 2010. In addition to the problems of uh, heat stresses, there are uh, what, what's called heat islands over cities, and this is increasing because of the excessive uh, the heat, uh, the heat and the excessive reflection of electromagnetic waves uh, and, and uh, urban structures. Uh, there is this heat may increase by two degrees, uh, maybe three degrees, and in some cases four degrees, depending on the population density of the city. Increasing population density increases the temperature of the heat island. This is the stress or the mortality index in Europe that goes with the heat wave. Uh, we can see that an increasing heat wave reflected an increase of the mortality of elderly people. Uh, this identifies one of the main or, or one of the major problems we do not have in developing countries, which is the, the uh, information or the data on a daily basis or hourly basis and so on. The availability of data is one of the major problems uh, we encounter here. Now, the urban resilience from the point of view of climatic phenomena has to do with the capability to prepare or respond to and recover from significant multi-hazard threats with minimum damage. The functioning of the system after a disaster or after uh, an encounter has to be uh, uh, capable to function, uh, to be safe, healthy, uh, upgrading the economy and security of a given urban area. Uh, of course, uh, this does not really reflect in many uh, of our cities. Uh, the most uh, I would say resilient at that time because it has uh, high Cornish was Alexandria and unfortunately uh, a marine storm in Alexandria in 2010 was uh, very disturbing uh, in this what, is the, what are the kind of problems we have? Uh, of course, we are identifying these problems to, to find, to end up at the solution. We are lacking some things. We are lacking some infrastructure. Unplanned development. High vulnerability to climate change and sea level rise. Exposure to heat waves. Exposure to disasters. Energy overconsumption and blackouts. 
socio-economic problems. Now, what do we need to, to upgrade our resilience or upgrade the resilience of thinking? We need very important aspects. Institutional systems and law enforcement. We will see examples of I don't know what is it. It's, it's uh, lack of awareness or uh, lack of uh, uh, I don't know, but we will we'll see some examples. Institutional systems should be capable of monitoring, assessment, law enforcement, and then monitoring again. Upgrading awareness and integrating risk information into proactive planning. In the city, like city of uh, 6 of October, the Green Belt was planned, but the implementation of city uh, just didn't agree to the uh, uh, Green Belt and uh, it was destroyed or replaced by other uh, buildings and the result is huge uh, uh, dust and uh, static storms affecting the machines in the, the lifetime of the machines in the factories, uh, the health of human beings and of course this this is reflected on the public image of the city. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but still exists. Uh, the waste Uh, this is the buildings, especially in the last couple of years. Uh, buildings all over the coast. Uh, beaches disappeared. Uh, the, we discovered that we are really, the Egyptians are really very, uh, very efficient in destroying their uh, tourist resources. Uh, the tsunami, we have to uh, worry about that because uh, there are some, uh, some uh, proposals that we may encounter a tsunami in the Mediterranean. Uh, a problem uh, of, of building up uh, underwater breakers uh, has proved it has been carried out and has proved to be very efficient in reducing the impact of tsunamis or marine storms. But we still are trying to find funding for building such uh, uh, system to, to upgrade the resilience of the city. This is uh, some area on the coast, people are building uh, two centimeters of the coast. The, the, the law allows building 200 meters from the coast, but people are still building uh, less than that. And this is really a very tragic uh, picture. This is the River Nile. This is a satellite image taken about 20 years from each other. Two satellite images overlay to show the land filling of the River Nile, the area. This is a high resolution, quick bird. Quick bird has a resolution of 50 centimeters. The red area 
is the area landfill of the river Nile. This is the channel of the river Nile near Rosette. This is the built area and slum areas were established. The other pink areas here, um, this is fish cages. You can see it very clearly all over the whole area. It's illegal. And then the bridge here that the governor goes by every day. Nobody complained. The governor did not complain. The systems of the, the, the government did not complain. Nothing. Everything can be done because of the lack of enforcement, lack of uh, institutional capabilities, and lack of monitoring. This is the beach of Abu Kir city. Two meters, they, uh, they started building uh, uh, 10 or 11 story buildings on the beach. There is no planning whatsoever, no uh, infrastructure, but the infrastructure, this is the waste water that goes on the beach. Would you believe that? So, what's important here that I don't know if this is clear or not, <coughs> that we have to have a monitoring system, an institutional system for monitoring and carrying out planning and development and so on, and then monitoring to see a follow-up. We do not follow up our plan. It has to be implemented and it has to be, we have to have a system to follow up our planning considerations. I will not go into details of uh, this is the upgrading the urban resilience. There are two methodologies, the, the hard structures and the soft structures, and we have several options here. Uh, this is one of the options of protecting coastal areas. <coughs> and the monitoring system has to use uh, satellites. We are not alone in the world. Now satellites uh, are capable of monitoring everything that has a resolution more than 30 centimeters in the, the civilian light. Anything that is greater than 30 centimeters, we can monitor. We have to carry out protection uh, against uh, storms and, and uh, tsunamis, and this is one of the projects to be carried out in Alexandria, uh, what's called Living Shoreline, extension of the Living Shoreline uh, in order to protect and have uh, touristic area. Uh, this is also the protection carried out in Emirates of the, uh, uh, the uh, Piera Palma trees carried out. But this has to be uh, carefully uh, considered. Uh, of course, we cannot end up without mentioning the Mazdar city. Mazdar is the highly uh, 
sustainable uh, city of Emirates uh, with the energy of solar energy and greenery uh, structures and designs and we hope to be able to develop our cities to some extent based on this aspect. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Professor Adonai. We now have 15 minutes for discussion, and um, you are invited to raise questions or give comments. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation, Dr. Um, you were talking a lot about uh, problems and challenges that uh, Egypt is facing. Uh, I would be very interested in uh, if you could elaborate a bit more, if you could elaborate a bit more on the solutions, uh, especially with regard to um, strengthening the, the system as well as in terms of monitoring and maybe also giving some more examples uh, what, uh, what could you envision in, in terms of uh, adaptation measures, not only with regard to the coastal uh, coastline, but in general in terms of uh, cities. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, measures of adaptation uh, actually has to be carried out especially in urban systems based on uh, the availability of institutional structure. Uh, we do not have uh, monitoring systems. We do not have uh, assessment uh, it's, it's very difficult, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, to have an institutional structure for 0.7% of the world's uh, emissions, and not to have an institutional structure for 15% of our gross national product is really very strange. But uh, the only way is building up a center to collect the data, make data free, available. We have problems uh, getting the data. We have problems uh, analyzing the data. Uh, periodically, it has to be analyzed periodically in order to identify the changes. We, we uh, carried out research uh, near Alexandria. We found out that the urban encroachment in agricultural land before issuing regulations before 83 was 0.1%. After issuing the regulations, it became seven times larger. The driving force is the economic benefits. And unless we have very strong enforcement and monitoring system, we are going to do very serious problems. Did I answer your question? Maybe I can add one question to this one, because what you said is really alarming. <laughs> I mean, 0.7% uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions, that's Egypt, but very vulnerable to climate change. Yeah. But in terms of institutional capacity, you said we are more capable of reducing emissions than to reduce our vulnerability. 
We are keep more capable of reducing our emissions. Yeah, this is very paradoxical. I mean, yeah. one can debate this. The, 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 the three students that drove me to the, from the airport last night, uh, I talked to them and we were forced to talk about the traffic because we were in a traffic jam, yes. And they said, uh, oh, traffic, low oil prices, the mentality of Egyptians uh, towards cars and their planning culture and everything, this will never change, right? It will be very hard to change. So they would say, we don't even have the capacity to produce emissions. But if we leave this aside, uh, for a country that is so vulnerable, that is really so vulnerable to climate change in the future, um, uh, the lack of capacity to deal with those problems is really, really, really problematic. And my question would be, you have, you have shown how such a system should look like to some degree, right? Monitoring and everything. But the interesting point would be how to get towards it. And are there other windows of opportunity that would help with that. For example, do you see that the current political situation in Egypt offers a window of opportunity to have raised awareness? Or is it a process that would even drive people away from those issues and they have other problems now and so forth? How would you be assessment about achieving this capability? Well, the problem is that uh, reducing greenhouse gases is very important. It's, uh, uh, it's cleaning air, uh, it's uh, uh, complying to international regulations, uh, uh, it, it, it builds up uh, capabilities, human capabilities in uh, treating, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and so on. So it's, uh, the, the capacity or the need for reducing emission is okay. Mm -hmm. But the percentage is very small. The contribution of Egypt to greenhouse gas emissions is very small. But the impact is at least from 10 to 15 percent of the national energy. We have uh, an institutional capability for, uh, we have, uh, for instance, a database for uh, emissions of all factories, uh, greenhouse gases, and, and the data is available, and all of, uh, all of this is available for the researchers. On the other side, the, the, the availability of data in each sector, not only the urban planning sector, but also in tourism and uh, water resources. There is no, there, there are a lot of uh, contradictions. The models, the regional models of, of development of uh, the impact on water resources, we do not know. It's uh, maybe 25% up, maybe 75% down. The, the, the shortage of data and shortage of integrating data and the researchers uh, is, is highly contradictory in this. Uh, it's incoherent research. Everybody is using uh, his own data and many are still not really very highly reliable. Now this is especially a problem for a centralized protection system, if you like. But if we would think about uh, the protection of everyday people, of their livelihoods, I think it's also a thing that uh, resilience should, be, should come to the minds. Uh, yes. Things like community-based education, for example. Do you, just the audience, uh, maybe have an idea? Or do, would you contradict this the diagnosis, or would you confirm it? And what would be your ideas about to, how to improve the resilience of, for example, the Egyptian uh, of Egypt to, for example, climate change? Do you have any good examples, or could you make us some more hope here? Could you provide us with something? Please. Thank you for uh, your program. It was in the 
the purple presentation, but I would like to uh, say something about uh, why you're not adapting uh, something like the knowledge-based urban development approach. Uh, we have to uh, raise the awareness of people at the same time and uh, raise the awareness of uh, the macro level and also in a macro level with the state strategies and the plan. Uh, so why not uh, uh, adapt this uh, approach and uh, make the uh, a development uh, based on knowledge and knowledge only uh, not with, uh, within the urban uh, planning and urban strategies uh, but also uh, among the citizens and uh, raise awareness of uh, how to uh, make knowledge uh, through uh, our life like uh, building the knowledge cities and uh, knowledge business and all uh, something like this not only uh, uh, as a professor uh, I don't think uh, said that uh, not only structures from up to down, but also from the uh, uh, bottom to up. Thank you. Uh, lecture also showing these quite impressive examples how it really looks 
uh, walking along the beach and looking at the Nile, what really happens. This is really quite uh, scary. And um, I just want to discuss about your, you mentioning that we, we, it's not so much a problem about the educated people, um, and at the same time about the notion of awareness, because uh, for me it's clear that we have problems about informal buildings where there are no regulations, but I think at the same time there's quite a large danger that developments, even like new Cairo, like the new developments on the beaches, like the resorts that actually do have um, an official development and that do incorporate the um, well-educated people, that this lack of awareness is maybe even more severe um, towards uh, creating structures and implementing structures that are uh, um, in danger of losing resilience, imagining like a new Cairo being so dependent on many things, like the minister just mentioned, two-thirds of the water used for building up all these landscapes there is drinking water that's used for irrigation rather than serving as drinking water, which is getting more and more uh, rare. And I think the same thing happens on the coast. And what I was also interested in, whether you could give some more ideas of you mentioned this project of the living shoreline, which should, as I understood it, incorporate some ideas of coastal protection and coastal pro um, defense, but at the same time um, uh, allow for new opportunities of tourism and people having access to the coast, which is really an integrated approach. And then you showed the image from um, Dubai, which for me it's also something quite scary, not so much of an integrated approach, but I, looking at these kind of developments, I look at projects, for example, in the Netherlands, that try to build new ecosystems that can enhance the protection, but at the same time integrate engineering and also the, the natural ecosystems in a new way. So I, I would be interested to hear what, what is this project about the living uh, shoreline, which is a very interesting t um, term to use, and that could maybe give some new visions also what that could mean for Egypt. Yes, uh, generally, uh, now what we consider is that uh, because decision makers uh, do not uh, really believe very much in climate change. So we say that uh, we should carry out uh, adaptation measures that are beneficial whether we have climate change or not. If we don't have climate change, we still need this measure to protect or to uh, have uh, some kind of uh, uh, nice view uh, to promote tourism or whatever. And actually, this has been carried out or suggested, I should say, suggested in Alexandria some of the areas, especially some of the closed bays where it was suggested to, to have uh, what's called uh, living shoreline because Alexandria is built on seven ridges, seven parallel, nearly parallel ridges. One of them is in water right now, underneath the, 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 uh, the shoreline, off the shoreline. So, uh, building some kind of islands uh, and using the already existing islands was suggested to uh, have a living shoreline by planting some trees on these uh, islands and uh, having bridges between uh, one island and another and so on in order to uh, have some kind of protection, first step protection of the city and have a nice view for tourists and for uh, the city. And this, this is a part of the integrated coastal zone management of the city. Uh, 
the adoption of integrated coastal zone management or the adoption of ideas. There are some other ideas of having underwater breakers in order to have uh, protection against tsunamis, against uh, marine storms, but it has not been implemented in many cases. Some cases are uh, being implemented now. But the problem is that it's not an official planning uh, that has been approved by the decision makers of the Alexandria. It's uh, carried out uh, whether, you know, whenever they have a project uh, funded or anything like that, they carry out a part of it. Uh, but it's not really uh, an approach for the government. You see what I mean? So it has to, to be taken, or integrated coastal zone management has to be taken as an approach. We have a lot of problems in uh, in path of climate change, Lake Marlut and Lake Borolos and uh, so many problems. There must be a system to make decisions. And uh, the decisions has to be integrated. And once it is made, it has to be followed up in order to implement it. But we have been promoting some ideas for over 20 years, and there is no implementation. OK, um, our time is up. We have to go. But still, this was actually to try to, to give a little bit of getting out of him a little bit of hope and sign of hope because there is something, but as we heard, it's not full-fledged and not fast enough. Uh, still, there are some uh, aspects that, that happen. I thank you all. I thank all of you that uh, participated. I thank Professor Um And I want you back to be back here at 2.30. And now I wish you a pleasant lunchtime. Thank you very much.